There was an article in Christianity Today some time ago about the new problem of polyamory among Christians. The article detailed a Christian couple who went to a Christian counselor about a problem they were having with potential infidelity, and apparently they were told by this so-called Christian counselor to just go ahead and embrace polyamory, the idea that a couple can bring multiple partners into their relationship. Now, the article asks, how can pastors and leaders prepare to address questions related to polyamory? Now, not surprisingly, the authors turn to scripture, and they concluded that scripture does clearly connect sex, marriage, and monogamy in ways that are violated in polyamorous relationships. Okay, so in a married couple situation, polyamory would be adultery. But what keeps the Christian couple from simply marrying these additional partners and bringing them into the marriage that way? I think most Christians would agree that doing so would change the sin from adultery to polygamy. But can Protestants actually prove from the Bible alone that polygamy is a sin? Or is that idea something that they have added on to Scripture as a tradition of men? Before proceeding, I do want to go over a few distinctions in terminology. I'm going to be talking about polygamy here, but really that is just sort of the generic word for multi-partner marriages. Polyamory is an even more generic term that just refers to sexual relationships, whether they involve marriage or not. So if it is more than two people in such a relationship, it's polyamory, but if those people happen to be married, it's polygamy. Further, Polyandry is a special kind of polygamy that has to do with a woman marrying multiple men, whereas polygyny is a special kind of polygamy where one man marries more than one woman. And that's really what we're talking about here. That is by far the most common case of polygamy. But just to avoid confusion, I am going to just be using the word polygamy throughout, as that is typically how it's understood. As strange as it may seem, it is actually pretty difficult to argue against polygamy using the Bible alone. I discovered this some years ago when my sister-in-law asked me where in the Bible does it say polygamy is a sin, and I found myself astonished that I had such a difficult time finding it. Even when I got into seminary, I discovered that the arguments that were used from the Bible to show that polygamy was a sin were actually so weak that it almost seemed to make the case for biblical polygamy stronger. Even more surprising, I discovered that it is actually easier to make a biblical case for polygamy than it is to make one against it. And if this is the case, then it's curious that Protestant groups across the spectrum typically are quite forcefully against polygamy. Where did they get this idea, assuming that the scripture is their highest authority? I'll come back to that topic at the end, but in the meantime, let's look at the case for and against polygamy from the Bible alone. When I was in seminary, one of our favorite biblical resources for researching topics was the Knaves Topical Bible. The Knaves Topical Bible includes polygamy in its index, but it only gives a few verses indicating that it is forbidden, and even these are qualified. It lists Deuteronomy 17.17, 17, but says that it's for kings. It lists Leviticus 18.18, 18, but notes that it concerns marrying sisters. And it also lists 1 Timothy 3.2, but points out that this is a verse for elders of the church. So right away we have an interesting issue here. The Knaves Topical Bible doesn't seem to be able to find an anti-polygamy verse that doesn't specifically address certain classes of people, but certainly not as if it is a universal law. And a closer look at these verses actually shows that they do not support an anti-polygamy stance, even if they are directed to kings, sisters, and elders. But it's interesting to note that my evangelical mentor, Norman Geisler, wrote in his Baker Encyclopedia of Christian Apologetics that scriptures repeatedly warn against having multiple wives. Deuteronomy 7. I found it interesting that Geisler claimed that the Bible repeatedly warned against polygamy and yet only listed one verse. The first problem with using Deuteronomy 17.17 17 is that this is a rule specifically for Israel's king. So even if it was a verse against polygamy, it wouldn't be something that we could just generalize to all people. The second problem is what it specifically says is that the king may not multiply wives. And this implies something more than mere addition. We're talking here about gathering, hoarding large numbers. 
And one of the reasons we know that is that he has the same injunction against multiplying horses, gold, and silver. But does that mean that the king can only have one gold coin or one horse? Pretty clearly not. He can't hoard these women or horses or gold or silver. He can simply have more than one, and that's all it takes to be polygamous. Another verse sometimes brought up in this debate is 1 Corinthians 7, 2. This verse says that because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Now, this verse is clearly an antidote to lust. It is not a limiting factor on the number of husbands or wives one may have. Consider a parallel. Because of the temptation to steal, each man should have his own car and each woman her own jewelry. This clearly is an antidote to stealing cars and jewelry, but it is not saying that someone can have only one. That brings us to 1 Timothy 3.2. This verse is directed to elders or overseers, depending on your translation, and it says that he must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, etc., now, this one requires a bit of knowledge about the underlying Greek, but essentially, as many commentators agree, the Greek for husband of one wife is really a one-woman man. It's essentially saying this is someone who is not promiscuous. Now, even if husband of one wife is actually what it said, then we would have an issue, but only for elders in the church. So at most, kind of like Deuteronomy 17.17, 17, we would have a qualified rule here that only fits a certain class of people and would not be an injunction against polygamy in general. Now, what's interesting is that not only does the Bible not seem to have any clear verses against polygamy in general or calling it sin, but it might even be seen to argue for the practice. Nave's Topical Bible, the resource that I quoted earlier, actually has several verses indicating the authorization, toleration, or even instructions regarding the practice of polygamy. Now, while someone can certainly argue that the Bible often records things that it does not approve of, in this case, we seem to have instructions and even, as we will see, approvals of polygamy itself. And it doesn't really make a lot of sense for God to give instructions about the proper way to commit sin. Further, Knaves lists several prominent biblical figures that were themselves polygamous. This includes Abraham, Esau, Jacob, Gideon, King David, and King Solomon. Now, in the case of Jacob, we have an interesting case where not only was Jacob a polygamist like his father Abraham, but his wife Leah is actually given approval by God for helping Jacob attain his wife. Further, it is stated in Scripture that King David was a man after God's own heart and that he never sinned against God except in the case of Bathsheba. Now, David was a polygamist. If polygamy was a sin, then he would have sinned the entire time he was married polygamously. But one of the reasons we can see that it not only doesn't seem to be wrong, but doesn't seem to be sin at all, is that God actually gave David his polygamous wives. It says in 2 Samuel 12, 8, God lists David's multiple wives as part of the blessings that God himself bestowed upon him. So here we see that not only in Scripture is there no clear injunction against polygamy in general, but we have several examples of godly men being polygamous, and, in at least two cases, God either approving or even rewarding someone with polygamy itself. That does not sound like the kind of thing God would do if polygamy was against his will. Martin Luther himself said that, I confess, I cannot forbid a person to marry several wives, for it does not contradict the scripture. Now, what's especially interesting for the Protestant here is that the Protestant churches led the way in accepting divorce as a legitimate end to a marriage, something the Catholic Church never did. But Malachi 2.16 says that divorce is something that God hates. So here we have a situation where pretty much every Protestant church in existence allows for something that God says he hates, and yet disallows something that God not only doesn't say he hates, doesn't say is sin, but actually approved of in Scripture. Finally, Protestants also allow remarriage after divorce, which is something that Jesus himself called adultery. So my question is, how in the world do the Protestants say that the Bible is their sole or highest authority in matters of faith and morals, and yet they seem to be practicing the exact opposite 
of what God said to do when it comes to marriage. Now, the Catholic Church also does not allow polygamy, but it is consistent in its belief because it does not claim to go to the Bible alone for its moral injunctions, but instead has relied on its extra-biblical traditions. And yet the Protestant Church that explicitly attacks the Catholics for adding unbiblical traditions of men to the Bible rides in on the same church's coattails every time it condemns polygamy, because you can't get that teaching from scripture alone. All right, I hope this video has been informative, entertaining, enjoyable. If it has, why don't you give it a like and subscribe to Douglas Beaumont if you are interested in Christian theology, apologetics, and philosophy. Until next time, God bless.